Uh, my name is Anthony Christie, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, my advisor is Dr. Milton Garces of the Infrasound Laboratory at uh, Hawaii as well. And uh, a little interesting fact, my undergrad is Slippery Rock University, which apparently gets mentioned at the football games here, so <laughs> that's going to bring that up. <laughs> so we're going to switch directions from uh, nuclear stuff, and we're going to switch back into infrasound. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about a framework for the collection, analysis, and verification of next generation infrasound data. So traditional infrasound arrays are great. You know, we were talking about the IMS station, and they're vital to studying nuclear explosions and other large types of explosions. And as a quick reminder, infrasound is simply sound that's less than 20 hertz. It's created by large movements of the atmosphere. And the problem with traditional infrasound arrays, and I heard this over and over and over again yesterday, is that we want more data. Or there's political reasons that you can't get access to data. Or perhaps the data is in another country that we don't have access to. So higher density and coverage of sensors is always a good thing. And you know, we can help mitigate the effects of atmospheric interference and other physical phenomena if we have a higher density of sensors. And we also want to be able to provide quicker deployment. Sometimes the traditional infrasound arrays can take a little bit of time to deploy. So what does a next generation infrasound sensor look like? Well, we want to be able to reduce the size of the sensors, the weights, the power, the cost. These are all good things. Um, we, we can make infrasound sensors as an app now. You can download this app on your iPhone. We're currently developing prototypes for Android as well. But the beauty of this is that these sensors are very easy to maintain. They're ubiquitous. I guarantee every one of you has one in your pocket right now. They provide multiple ways of communication, whether you want to communicate over Wi-Fi, you can communicate over the cellular network, or if you're in a location where you don't have normal paths <coughs> of communication, we can collect the data off the cell phones themselves. We can download directly from the devices. And we're built using industry standard technology. So we record sub-audio data, and we send that over the network. We encode the data in uh, WAV files, audio files. Uh, you know, if you've heard of WAVE, it was popular in the 90s, it's uncompressed. But it's a beautiful file format because we're able to include uh, metadata in the file itself. It's a chunked file format so that we can go in and include things like latitude, longitude, uh, the device that it's coming from, timing information, synchronization information, etc. So, you know, when we were traditionally doing this, we had a nice 24-core server in uh, Kailua Kona on the Big Island. And it had 64 gigs of RAM, and I thought to myself, boy, we're never going to need anything more powerful than this. And it's amazing how quickly the, the, the times have changed. And the president's report on big data mentions three things that makes big data big. The first is velocity, the speed of the data that's coming in. And in our case, our infrasound sensors are continuously and constantly streaming audio data in the form of wave files. So the data is coming in very, very fast. The volume of data is also much larger than anything we've seen before. Currently, we're easily pulling gigabytes of data uh, per day, and we're probably going to be in the terabyte range within the next couple of years. And this is simply not something that we can do with a traditional server architecture. And finally, the variety of data has given us a lot of challenges. Uh, if you think about the fact that your cell phones can be sensors, they come from different manufacturers. The microphones are produced from different manufacturers. So the data that we get is very heterogeneous, and that makes it tough to go through and do data quality. So you know, this is where the realm of big data comes in. We're there now, so we need to figure out a better solution. So what I've been working on is a next generation framework to help tackle these issues of the amount of data coming in. And my framework uh, basically comes in uh, three or four parts. We have a very scalable data acquisition layer, which collects the data from all of our infrasound sensors. We have an interface that allows us to do uh, sensor monitoring and data discovery uh, in an intuitive fashion. We have to provide time synchronization between our devices so that we can correlate results between our sensors. And we want to be able to do real-time analysis and classification. We're not really there yet. This is something that I'm working on with a collaboration with Lawrence Livermore. Um, and the one thing I really want to note is that we're really embracing open source software. We wouldn't have been able to build uh, you know, half of the software that we've done if we didn't have software to build on top of. So what took a year probably would have took five without open source software. So I just want to put a big plug in for the open source community. 
So the data acquisition layer of our framework is important for collecting the audio files from our sensors and extracting the metadata. So again, the metadata may be latitude, longitude, timestamps, time synchronization metrics. And as soon as we receive that data, we extract the metadata and store it in a, net, uh, a database, which allows us to later query that data and, and to perform ad hoc queries depending on what exactly we're looking for, whether it's a location of the, a certain set of devices or a time that a device might have been active to find out if we can get data from that device. And it was designed for scalability in mind. It was designed for the cloud. We use uh, ACA Actors, which is a uh, immutable message passing system which provides for a lot of scalability so that we can scale from not just hundreds or thousands of devices, but hundreds of thousands to millions of devices. So we collect the data over uh, WebSockets, a new internet standard. Uh, we decode it, whether it's barometer data or microphone data. And then we store the metadata in the database, and we store the original audio files uh, either on a file system, traditional file system, or more recently, we're storing it directly to the cloud. And with all of that metadata, we're able to get a global view of device health. So with a click of a mouse and going to a web page, we can easily go in and see the which is mouse um, uh, We can easily go in and see which of our devices are currently active. We can see how long it's been since we received data from a device. Uh, we can find out the location of the devices, the number of microphone packets we received, barometer packets, the API, etc. And we can drill down in and get more statistics for individual devices. Uh, we keep track of things like the number of audio files per hour that we receive per sensor, or, thank you, or um, the average round trip latency between uh, the devices and our servers. And these are all statistics that we care about because it tells us something about the quality of our data uh, to make sure that our data that we're looking at is, is worthwhile to look at. And, uh, we just recently implemented an interactive data discovery interface. Um, this is obviously white. And uh, you can provide a, a start timestamp and an end timestamp. And this interface will show you all of the sensors that were active between those timestamps. And then you can select an event source. And once you select an event source, it gives us all of the devices um, in order of distance from that event source. It gives us the estimated arrival time of an infrasonic event to each of those devices from the event source. And it also gives us an estimated back azimuth to the event from each of those sensors, um, which is really helpful when we're trying to estimate you know, which data do we need when we're looking at an event source. So for instance, we had a satellite break up over the island of Maui a couple weeks ago, uh, the Cosmos satellite, and we were able to pick it up on our cell phones and the, the infrasound signature. And we use this interface to go in and download the audio data that, uh, that came from that event source to do further analysis. Um, I'm running out of time, so quickly. Time synchronization. <coughs> when you hear a noise, how do you know which direction it came from? It's because that noise enters your ears at two different times. And the internal clock in your brain tells you which direction it came from. Well, we have the same issue with infrasound sensors. You need to be able to tell which direction. So they have to be highly synchronized. We uh, constructed a uh, message exchange algorithm similar to NTP, but a little bit better. And it can be ran on any uh, Linux server. Right now we're using a Raspberry Pi, but if you have a Linux box, you can run it. Um, so everything, all of our data is synchronized to a master clock with a relative accuracy of one millisecond. Um, so things are synchronized. And finally, uh, like I said, currently we are in the process of transitioning everything from a, a traditional server environment to the cloud. So we're looking to do distributed real-time analysis using Apache Spark and Spark Streaming, uh, Python with its full library of scientific libraries, um, Real-time event reporting, if, if an infrasonic event happens, we want to know where it happened, when it happened, and how big was the boom. So, um, as I mentioned, I have a collaboration with Lawrence Livermore, uh, collaborating with Stephen Madanya Zook and his team, and we are working on signature classification, data quality, and verification. Uh, finally, um, right now we're just looking at infrasound data from cell phones, but we want to look at everything as a data source. Imagine if you could scrape YouTube, or SoundCloud, or Twitter, or you know, the idea of data fusion. If, if we can mix this with other data sources, we can get a much clearer picture of the world around us. And that's what I'm really interested in doing. So thank you. So what I did was I placed uh, it on the ground, and I imaged it overnight for about 10 hours. And as you can see, you get an image on the left side of the